uh, indeed a, a pleasure to uh, be here again and to talk a little bit uh, about what I think is a very exciting uh, area in 2019, and that has to do with new understanding uh, of what we call lactic acidosis, and we'll talk a little bit more about our terminology. I've broken my talk into three parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to talk about the type AB classification. The second part, about sepsis and is it type A, is it type B, is it both? And then I'm going to finish with some case studies. Traditionally and currently, uh, we talk about type A and type B. And when we talk about type A lactic acidosis, we're talking about the cells being deprived of oxygen, typically because of hypoperfusion, but it could be because of very low oxygen uh, in the blood. Uh, this is what we all hated to have to learn to memorize in medical school, the Krebs cycle. Uh, our body uses glucose to generate energy, and glucose is converted to pyruvate, and pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and enters the Krebs cycle, where it generates a lot of energy, a lot of ATP. But if something, if there's a problem in the Krebs cycle, or if there's no oxygen, because the Krebs cycle is oxygen dependent, uh, then we begin to see body responses to try to generate energy because the body cannot survive without energy. So when we talk about aerobic metabolism, we're talking about aerobic glycolysis aerobic conversion of glucose into the channels that will drive energy. And when we talk about lactic acidosis type A and tissue hypoxia, we're talking about anaerobic glycolysis traditionally. When there is inadequate tissue oxygen, glucose is driven through anaerobic glycolysis to produce energy in a less efficient system. And this is the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway where pyruvate is converted to lactate and in the process creates a little bit of energy uh, but not a lot of energy, but a little bit of energy is better than no energy at all. And the process of aerobic glycolysis is also present uh, when there is adequate oxygen. So we still tend to shift from pyruvate to lactate and from lactate to pyruvate in a normal course of action as our bodies work and perhaps in exercise, it becomes very, very important uh, because lactate, even though it's not very efficient in generating energy, generates it a lot quicker and more usable and faster uh, than going through the Krebs cycle. And that's likely the reason that we get a lot of lactate in extreme exercise uh, because it's very quickly useful when you need it quickly. Is lactate an acid? Well, we, we see these terms, lactic acid, lactic acidosis, we don't see lactate acidosis, but we see hyperlactemia. Probably the correct term is hyperlactemia, uh, more so than any of the other terms. Uh, but let me just read you something. Hopefully I can read it. This is from 1978. <clears throat> this um, academician says, 
Anaerobic glycolysis produce, produces lactate, ATP, and water, but there is no net change in the number of hydrogen ions. It does not produce lactic acid. The acidosis usually associated with hyperlactemia is caused by hydrolysis of the ATP with release of hydrogen ions. So you say, well, that was 1978. That was 22 years ago, uh, 22 plus 20, 40, over 40 years ago. I'm sure that we've straightened things out by now. So. Let me now read you uh, one of the most um, accepted deans of lactate uh, physiology and metabolism, uh, someone named Robert Robergs. <clears throat> in 2018 in physiology said, as we will explain, there's no such entity as lactic acid in any living cell or physiologic system. Indeed, it is impossible based on the fundamental laws of physics that underpin the disciplines of organic chemistry, metabolic biochemistry, acid-based chemistry, and physiology for lactic acid to be produced or present in living systems. So maybe the right term is lactate associated acidosis because clearly there is H plus. So we have to go back to the drawing boards and talk about why it's there. <clears throat> Perhaps um, now I, I'm going to go, you'll hear me use lactic acidosis again because I can't help it. You'll see figures that I use where they have lactic acid in there uh, because I think it's sort of like the wedge pressure. If we use a PA catheter, we all say, what was the wedge pressure? But it's not a wedge pressure. It's a balloon occlusion pressure. It's called a wedge pressure because when they first started doing it, they pushed that catheter without a balloon into the pulmonary arterial system until it wedged. And so we still call it wedge. So we're likely still call the, this lactic acidosis. <clears throat> Even if I can't convince you uh, that uh, it, lactate doesn't produce acid. Now, we, <clears throat> we talked about type A uh, traditionally uh, being thought of as anaerobic uh, glycolysis and type B, where there's no tissue hypoxia or hypoperfusion, congenital metabolic disorders, uh, hepatic disease. Traditionally, when we said hepatic disease is causing lactic acidosis, we said that's because <clears throat> it's metabolized in the liver and the liver is so crappy it can't metabolize it anymore. Uh, recently, there's some data that actually most of the lactate associated with liver disease uh, may be coming from lactate production as opposed to failure to clear. Acute leukemia as the poster child of malignancy associated lactic acidosis and a lot of drugs, and we'll talk about some of those. <clears throat> Let me go back to a point I made earlier. Um, we all produce some lactate through aerobic glycolysis with oxygen present and the conversion of pyruvate to lactate, even if we have plenty of oxygen. And that tends occurs to occur when there's a lot of glucose going into the cell or when there's increased sodium potassium pump activity, like with catecholamines with the beta agonist. We also see type B with mitochondrial dysfunction, impaired pyruvate dehydrogenase activity, thiamine deficiency, beriberi, and alkalosis. But I want to go back to what I've uh, highlighted in yellow because that's the current best theory for why we see lactic acidosis in sepsis, that it's being driven by increased aerobic uh, 
glycolysis because the system is just being jammed with glucose and it cannot handle it. So this would be a type B stress hyperlactemia. Um, maybe there's some A with sepsis, particularly early before fluid resuscitation, uh, but the current thinking is it's predominantly B. Um, this is a nice review article in Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology that covers some of these points. Uh, but what's happening is that the pyruvate acetyl-CoA Krebs cycle uh, just can't handle it. So it's being pushed out to lactate, uh, and the lactate's producing energy, but it's doing some other uh, interesting things that I'll show you. Uh, this shows intracellular lactate shuttle and lax lactate oxyg oxygenation complex, and you're not going to be able to see it very well, but uh, let me make a, just a couple of points. Uh, this is pyruvate going to lactate, and then lactate is actually going intracellularly and can be converted back to pyruvate in the mitochondria and then going into the TCA or the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Uh, it's also going extracellularly into the blood. And I think you'll be able to see this one a little bit better, uh, but what this one shows uh, is that lactate is involved in what's called the lactate shuttle meaning that pyruvate is converted to lactate, and lactate is going not only into that cell's mitochondria to drive ATP through the Krebs cycle, but it's going to, a, to adjoining cells, and it's getting in the bloodstream, and it's going to other organs, and once it gets in those organs, if it has capability, it'll be converted back to pyruvate and then enter the Krebs cycle. Most of the lactate is metabolized in the liver or the kidney and excreted to a small degree in the kidney. This is the first of a, a couple of cases. A 71-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, is brought to the emergency department by a neighbor with altered mental status and depressed level of consciousness. She's intubated for airway protection. Her vitals are normal except for tachycardia. She's a febrile. Her evaluation in the emergency department is unremarkable with no obvious source of infection and laboratory that is unremarkable except for a creatinine that's significantly above her baseline and a lactate of 18. She lives by herself, but her friend says she has diabetes and hypertension with a history of a stent for coronary artery disease. Her friend does not have a list of her medications. So what's the differential diagnosis? It's got to be sepsis, so you got to draw blood cultures, you got to start antibiotics. Uh, even with a blood pressure that's not low, maybe she's really tightened down, and if you did an echo, you'd see that she has a low EF. But in this particular case, uh, she was on metformin. And metformin is the newer version of an older biguanide called fenformin. And fenformin uh, was in the classic uh, English mnemonic mud piles for causes of high anion gap, um, methanol and toxic alcohols, uremia, DKA, fenformin, iron overdose, lactic acidosis, ethylene glycol and salicylates. Now, fenformin was taken off the market 
because there clearly was a well-definable incidence of lactic acidosis. It's less clear with the current version of a biguanide metformin. In fact, when we talk about metformin lactic acidosis, we classify it into three types. Metformin independent lactic acidosis, that means the patient's on metformin, but they're growing staph out of the blood uh, and they have septic shock, so that's clearly the cause. Metformin induced lactic acidosis, that if you have elevated metformin levels uh, and you have absolutely no other reason uh, for there to be uh, lactic acidosis, then you call it metformin induced. That is very rare. And finally, metformin associated lactic acidosis called MALA, uh, which means, well, maybe it is, uh, we're concerned that it might be. Uh, but we can't say that there aren't alternatives in the differential diagnosis. Wanted to show you uh, just a, a few more drugs that I think are important to remember. Uh, certainly the, uh, the AIDS drugs, the nucleosidic reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, are uh, associated with lactic acidosis. Epinephrine and inhaled beta agonists if you remember uh, the, some of the big epinephrine trials, like the French study with Jalali Anand, compared epinephrine uh, with norepinephrine versus norepinephrine uh, plus dobutamine, and clearly they measured lactate, uh, and the lactates were associated uh, with uh, the epinephrine group. Uh, in a different fashion than the norepinephrine and dobutamine. We all, and, but it's not thought to be an issue. It should not keep us from using epinephrine in septic shock uh, because it's lactate. Inhaled beta agonist, uh, when you use aggressive continuous inhaled beta agonist, you will indeed uh, measure some lactate in the blood and again, it's not thought to be clinically significant. Another case, a 65-year-old male is admitted to the ICU with right lower lobe pneumonia and alcohol withdrawal syndrome. <clears throat> he has a history of COPD and severe hypertension at baseline. He is intubated and mechanically ventilated. He is day six of ICU stay in his own ceftriaxone and azithromycin. His medications include a benzodiazepine protocol that was begun on day one that was in transition to a propofol drip. Agitation has become a big problem whenever sedation is weaned. One day, uh, P.O. Seroquel was started two days ago Steroids were begun one day ago for wheezing on physical exam. He became hypotensive and following fluid bolus is on norepinephrine 15 mics per minute. His lactate is 12, his CK is 6,000, and now he has a ventricular tachycardic arrest. Which one of the following is the most likely cause of his multiple organ dysfunction? Seroquel azithromycin, steroids, or propofol. So this is propofol infusion syndrome. I'm sure most of you uh, knew what this was, but just assume most of the other people did too, so you didn't want to look like a show-off. Uh, propofol infu infusion syndrome, or PRIS, uh, has questionable genetic predisposition. Uh, it also is thought to be uh, the milieu created uh, by catechol, uh, catecholamine excess uh, and glucocorticoids. Uh, the proteolysis produces a, a myopathy, so you see rhabdo. You see 
uh, fatty acid infiltration of the liver. Uh, in fact, our old friend Lactate, uh, the, the original theory for Pris was that the problem is the liver is getting infiltrated with the fat in the propofol. That's producing the lactic acid, and that's where the acidosis is coming from. Uh, but now it's thought uh, that uh, the acidosis is due to changes in the mitochondrial machinery due to the fatty acid effects, and it has multiple effects inside the cytosol and on the mitochondria. What about the VTAC? Uh, there's a very characteristic EKG finding in PRIS. Uh, where you see a right bundle branch block, uh, but the right bundle branch block in the uh, anterior V leads has upward coving of the ST segment, and that's a precursor to the ventricular tachycardia that you may see in this syndrome. Uh, just a comment about L lactate and D lactate. When, when we measure lactate, in our patients, we measure L lactate. And there's good reason. That's because that's pretty much all there is, is L lactate. We produce a small amount of D lactate. We used to think that maybe we didn't produce any, but now with more sophisticated measuring systems, we can measure small amounts. But there are there is a circumstance, at least one, where we see clinically significant D lactic acidosis. And if you think you got it, you got to go down to the lab and you got to make arrangements to get something to measure D lactate because it's not routinely measured. Which one of the following is the most likely cause of clinically significant D lactic acidosis? Ethylene glycol toxicity, short bowel syndrome, penicillamine or aspergillus infection. So, so the clue is that if our body doesn't make it, then some other organism has to be making it. And the only place where we have a lot of organisms that might be of a species that would make D-lactate, because there, there are quite a few bacteria that make D-lactate, is they have to be in, in the large bowel. And you see it in short bowel syndrome. Where are most of the carbohydrates absorbed almost totally in our bodies? Small bowel. So our colons normally don't see a lot of carbohydrates to metabolize and to convert uh, to lactate. But if you give them a lot of carbohydrate loads and you get those bacteria down there, they will in some patients produce. This is why we don't do the type of surgery anymore for obesity uh, where you hook a short piece of the small bowel into the colon because they got D-lactic acidosis. Does Ringer's lactate cause lactic acidosis? Well, you would say if Dr. Dellinger explained lactic acidosis in a fashion that's true and lactate is not acid, then it shouldn't produce lactic acidosis. And it doesn't. Does Ringer's lactate increase the serum lactate elevation? Do you, do you see increased measured serum lactate if you use LR uh, in infusion for shock? And the answer is yes. And that was shown quite nicely in a meta-analysis. Uh, this, this is Ringer's lactate on the top in these clinical trials. And this is normal saline. And what you see, this is the zero point uh, here and here, and, and you see that the lactate went up on average about 1.5 to 2, 
So it would have some minimal effect on measuring uh, lactate changes if you were using that for a target, but unlikely to be clinically significant. And I'll, I'll finish with this slide um, that just shows a lot of things uh, that lactate does. Uh, it's involved with memory function. Uh, it's involved as a alternative fuel for creating energy, both in exercise, but perhaps also in other stress states. Uh, and it now has been shown to have a lot of endocrinology feedback loops. Uh, so I remember years and years ago when nitric oxide was coming into its own, uh, people would, I think it was nitric oxide, the molecule of the year. Uh, and I think as we learn more and more about lactate and the importance it plays, uh, it may well be a candidate uh, for molecule of the year. Thank you very much. I guess we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Okay. Yeah. How do you feel about the current obsession we have, at least in the States, about this lack of experience as a role for society? Yeah, so the, the questions for the interpreters uh, is, you know, how do I feel? about the lactate clearance uh, as a goal of therapy. Um, I think lactate clearance, because lactate is sort of a, to me it's sort of a cosmetic innocent bystander for the real problem, no matter what the real problem is. And in this case, sepsis is the real problem and sepsis is doing things that may kill off organs. And lactate is actually probably there trying to help out, trying to, to, to make energy and send it somewhere it can find a change in the pyruvate where it can get into the Krebs cycle and create energy. Um, so I, I, I would treat to try to get the lactate down, uh, but that may not be related to tissue perfusion. Um, I think that's part of the issue. You know, I said I thought that septic shock is a combination of type A and type B. I think there are some tissue perfusion issues. Uh, there, there may be pre-capillary shunt. Um, there may be other things where if you, if you increase the macro circulation, there may be some areas that are uh, you can convert from anaerobic glycolysis to aerobic glycolysis through the pyruvate cycle. The aerobic glycolysis through the pyruvate to lactate is not what, where you need the help. You need help in, in getting it down to acetyl-CoA from pyruvate and into the Krebs cycle. That's where the big bucks are. So I still think it's important, uh, but... It, it's not what I thought of it, say, two or three years ago. So lactate in itself is not deleterious or nauseous. It's just a marker. Um, I would say most likely that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Bueno, continuamos con el siguiente módulo. Hola, eh, muy buenos días a todos. A continuación vamos a tener eh, un trabajo libre. ¿Dónde está el...? Sí, ¿no? 